song or the words of that song were written 250 years ago by John Newton. John Newton was a slave boat captain. He encountered a dangerous storm one night, gave his life to Jesus and lived the rest of his life to preach in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I asked the praise team to do that song for us to remind us that every single believer in this place, every single person has put their faith and trust in Jesus. John Newton's testimony is our testimony. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. Anybody have that testimony today? Thank you, you may be seated. We're gonna to talk today about a literal blind man and just like John Newton's testimony, that the words of amazing grace is our testimony as well. Blind Barnabas testimony, blind Barnabas life is our life as well. It's, his, it's our testimony today. We're gonna to look at his name. His name is Barnabas, he's literally blind. And, uh, and I wanna say this on the offset of this message today. You may be here this morning and you have 20-20 vision. You may can see, you know, like an owl or whatever. But the bottom line is, if you don't know Jesus, you're spiritually blind. And so today I want to just kind of challenge us through the Word of God in our study in the book of Mark where we're at. Pick it up where we left off last Sunday. And I want to talk about a faith that will cause blinded eyes to see. And I, obviously, I... I I'm not just talking about physical blind eyes, although Jesus can do all of that, but we're talking about spiritually blind eyes as well. So um, I want you to take your Bible, turn your Bible on, get to the Word of God, and we're in Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. We're going to pick it up where we left off last week, starting beginning at verse 46. And I want to show you a, a picture of faith that will cause our spiritual blinded eyes or physical blinded eyes to see as well. Mark chapter 10. And uh, if you don't mind, let's stand one more time for the reading of God's word. I don't mind you standing for a little while because you're going to be sitting for a long time. <laughs> Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 46. You found it, say found it. <laughs> they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now many warned him, keep quiet, shut up. But he was crying out all the more, have mercy on me, son of David. Jesus stopped and he said, call him. And so they called the blind man and said to him, have courage, get up, he's calling for you. And he threw off his coat, jumped up, came to Jesus. When Jesus answered him, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus, he said to him, or Rabboni, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has saved you. And immediately he could see and began to follow Jesus on the road. Father, thank you, Lord, for the worship, the praise we've had today. All of it, Father. Thank you for your amazing grace, Father, that causes blinded eyes to see lost people to be found. Praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, this is the last recorded miracle that Mark records from Jesus as he makes his way up to Jerusalem. Now, 
What we've done, we've come full circle. Uh, from chapter 8, verse 22, all the way to chapter 10 in this last verse we just read, uh, Jesus is pouring his teaching into his disciples in what we call the discipleship discourse. And uh, it began in chapter 8, verse 22, believe it or not, with the healing of an unnamed blind man. Now, during this time, as Andrew pointed out last week, three different times, Jesus has told his disciples, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be beaten, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die, but I'm going to raise, again, on three different occasions. He tells them that. Uh, And basically, what Andrew pointed out last week was this, they said, okay, we get it. You're going to die. You're going to be crucified. You know, you're going to raise again third day. That's good. That's fine. But Jesus, what are you you going to do for us? I mean, what, 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 uh, you know, what, what, what are you going to, how, how can we sit on your right hand and sit on your left hand? Which one of us is going to be the greatest? Now, Jesus begins this climb. He's on the Jericho road. And believe it or not, it's a 3,500 foot climb from Jericho all the way up to Jerusalem. When you read the Bible, Jerusalem is always always up, up to Jerusalem. And so uh, he's going to the cross. His last miracle before he gets there is this healing of this known blind man, Bartimaeus. Now, Bartimaeus has only heard about Jesus. Obviously, he's never seen Jesus. He has never spent any time with Jesus. And yet we're going to see this morning that he exhibits some great discipleship principles that even Jesus' own disciples have not exhibited, even though they've spent three years with him. And it has nothing to do with his personal knowledge of Jesus. He's never met him. He's just heard about him. And listen to me, it has nothing to do with discipleship principles that Jesus has poured into him. The only time Jesus has ever spoken to him is said, what do you want? And so it has nothing to do with any of that. It's all rooted in his faith, in his faith. And it's all there. Um, so you and I, listen to me, listen to me. I believe, I believe in discipleship principles. I, I believe in what we're doing around here with all my heart, that we're trying to make disciples and make disciples, and we're pouring into you. Uh, the preachers around here, the, 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 the music around here, uh, all of it is pouring into you to build, to, to build you up, to, for you to know Jesus. How many of you know, just because you're saved don't mean you know Jesus? Amen. you got to spend time with Jesus. And so we're doing everything we can around here to cause you, to help you to spend time with Jesus. And I believe in all of the discipleship principles that we're trying to pour into you. And and listen, we got Bible study. We got three Bible studies on Sunday morning. We got a tremendous Bible study on Wednesday night, verse by verse, a seminary quality Bible study with Dr. Chris Dickerson. We've got uh, a ladies' Bible studies on Sunday night and Tuesday morning. We have three Sunday school hours. We have all, we have all kinds of D groups, all of, and I'm for all of that. But listen to me and listen well. It doesn't matter how deep you get into the Word. It doesn't matter how much you dissect the Word. It doesn't matter how much you expound the Word. The bottom line is you and I will never grasp these discipleship principles unless we trust Jesus by faith. We got to trust. Listen, he will never let you off the hook with that. Uh, Go ahead and and prepare your 401k. Go ahead and have plan B's all over the place. But I'm telling you, the walk with Jesus is always by faith. The book of Hebrews says without faith, it's impossible to please God. And all God's people said, you're never, I am never going to ever get to the point to where I can't trust Jesus by faith. This church will, I don't care how much money we have in the bank. I don't care how much, you know, God is using us. The bottom line is we are a faith ministry and Jesus will never relent. He will tell you if you're going to follow me, you have got to walk by faith and not by sight. And all God's people say, it's faith. And it was the faith of Barnabas that changed his life. We have to understand that. Now I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, what, what if now just give me a, a scenario here. What if I said to you today, I can prove to you that Jesus is who he says he is. I can prove to you 
that Jesus is the Son of God. I can prove it. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to ask Jesus to lift the roof off this building, spin it around three times, and put it gently back down on this building. Now, Jamie, who's in charge of our building around here, he would say, Pastor, go ahead and do that, but you make sure Jesus puts it down right. (laughs) Now, what if he did it? What if I said, Jesus, lift this roof up, spin it around three times, put it back down on his foundation. While that's happening, you get out your smartphone, you, you, you record the whole thing, you post it on social media, what in the world do you think? That, listen, that would take care of all the skeptics. All the skeptics would see that. And just think about it. Just think about what that would do to our attendance next Sunday if that happened. And by the way, that's what the world needs, right? The world is longing for proof. Just prove to me that Jesus is real. I would love to see Jesus lift this roof off, spin it around three times, put it back down, and I would, that would be awesome. That's what this world needs. Not according to Jesus, it's not. Because Jesus lifting this roof up, spinning it around three times and placing it back down, that's sight. That's not faith. And Jesus said, you really want to be blessed. Blessed are those that have not seen me and still believe. And so it's faith. You're never going to be released of having to trust Jesus by faith. I don't care where you are. I don't care how everything's falling in place or not falling into place. And uh, so uh, I want you to see six areas today where uh, we must, you know, how Jesus can, can cause our blinded eyes to see. Six areas that we must have in order to have our blind. Now, no, hang on, hang on. It's okay. It's okay. I'm, you're looking at me right now. You said six. Lord have mercy. When Andrew preaches and Chris preaches, and you preachers, and y'all have three points. We're here half the day. And you got six. Hang on. It's going to be, we're going to go by fast. Okay. Can I get an amen? All right. So it's, it's okay. And we got pizza waiting on you anyway, so it don't matter. All right. So we're going to look at six areas in this story of how blinded eyes can see. Here they are. And if you're not a note taker, be, you'd do well to take notes on this today because you're probably going to need it, Bubba. Here it is, number one. A faith that opens your eyes is a faith that knows that Jesus is your only hope. Can I get an amen on that? A faith that opens your eyes is a faith that knows that Jesus is your only hope. Let's go to verse 46. Verse 46, Barnabas, the son of Timaeus. A blind beggar was sitting by the road. Now listen to me. A Barnabas was not just a beggar. Now being a beggar was bad enough. I have no idea what that's like. I, I have no idea. But he's not just a beggar. You see, him being a beggar means he has nothing. He has no body. He has nobody that cares for him. He has nobody that, that's, you know, that's going to you know, uh, watch over him. He's a beggar. Everything he has in life, he has to beg for it. And he has to trust others to have any kind of compassion on him to do that. So being a beggar, that's one thing. But notice, the Bible says he was a blind beggar. That's even worse. I mean, he has, no, he has no idea if anybody's given him anything or not. If, it's, if, 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 if somebody drops, a, you know, a denarii in a cup, he don't know if they took it right back out. He don't know. I mean, he is a blind beggar. So the bottom line is, Bartimaeus knows, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that he has a great need. Now, he has heard of the miracle working power of Jesus. He's, he's heard of it. Now he understands and somebody tells him, Jesus, that same Jesus, that famous Jesus, the Jesus that's well known, the miracle working Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem on the Jericho road, right where you're sitting. Jesus is going to pass by you. And so Bartimaeus knows this is his only shot. This is his only chance. And so as he hears the crowd and he senses that Jesus is passing by him, he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he begins to cry out. By the way, that word for cry out in the Greek is the same word we get the word crazy from. Everybody thought he was crazy. Well, that's just crazy blind Bartimaeus. He's crazy. And the crowd was saying to him, shut up. You're embarrassing yourself and you're embarrassing us. Just be quiet. I wonder, Bible don't say, 
But I'm wondering if some of Jesus' own 12 disciples weren't in that crowd telling him to shut up. What we know about them so far, I wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> Amen? I mean, you know, they haven't been, they haven't been in a favorable light up, in, up into this time. And so they're telling him, be quiet, be quiet. The crowd's thinking he's, he's crazy. But you notice that doesn't stop him. He doesn't worry about what the crowd says. He doesn't worry about what the culture says. He didn't, he didn't wonder what politics are. He could care less. He has a great need, and he knows Jesus is coming by, and this is his one chance in life, maybe, to get healed by the great miracle-working healer of Jesus. So he cries out all the more, Jesus, have mercy on me. The crowd didn't stop him at all. I want you to notice something in verse 49. Look at verse 49. I love this. Listen to what it said. Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped. Now, I've heard a lot of scripture about Jesus wept. I get that. But here it says, Jesus stopped. Now, I want you to think about that just for a moment. Think about what that means. Jesus has already told his disciples. He knows he's going up to Jerusalem. He knows he's going to be falsely accused and falsely arrested. He knows he's going to be beaten to an inch of his life. He knows he's going to die on a cruel cross and he's going to be buried. But he knows that three days later, he's going to be rose again. Wouldn't you say at this point, because Jesus is making his way up now, wouldn't you think Jesus got a lot on his mind? There's just a lot on his mind. You, th you think you got pressure? You, you, you think you got pressure on your job? How would you like to have the sins of the whole world waiting on you? Some of you think you do, but you don't. I think he has a lot on his mind. But in the middle of that, he stops. Listen to me. You listen and say amen. amen. God has never got so much going on. He is never so busy. He is never so wrapped up in the world situation that he won't take time to stop and meet your need right where you are. Amen. That's what he'll do. That's how he does. He's never so busy. And Lord knows he's busy right now, right? But he's never so busy. He won't stop and take care of your need. But here's the deal. You gotta, you've got to admit you have a need. That's right. And then you've got to call on him to meet that need. To meet that need. Here's, here's number two. A faith that opens the eyes is a faith that believes who Jesus is. He believes who Jesus is. Look at verse 47. And when he heard it, it was Jesus of Nazareth. He began to cry. By the way, the crowd is calling him Jesus of Nazareth. But listen to what he does. He cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David is a messianic term. Uh, and he said it twice. So Barnabas, for some reason, somehow knows that Jesus is the Messiah. There's only been, up until this time, there's only been one other person that has admitted that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and that was Peter. And Peter has spent three years with Jesus. Barnabas just now meets Jesus, and for some reason, he knows that Jesus is the son of David. He is the Messiah. One commentator put it this way, and I love this. What Barnabas lacked in eyesight, he made up for with insight. That's a great statement. What he lacked in eyesight, he made up for with insight. Matter of fact, Bartimaeus is a better example of a disciple than the disciples who've been with Jesus for three years. It's amazing. Now, I know what people say. I've, I've heard people say, well, you know, the disciples didn't get it until Jesus resurrected from the dead. Then after he resurrected, they got it. Well, what do you do with Bartimaeus? Bartimaeus got it. Jesus hadn't resurrected from the dead yet. There's just something in him. It's his faith. God is honoring his trust, his faith, his need. And he realizes Jesus is his only help and his only hope. Here's number three. A faith that opens your eyes is a faith that appeals to God's mercy. It appeals to God's mercy. Look at verse 47. He began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Now listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Let me go to this side. Uh, Barnabas could not do one single thing for Jesus. Not one. And he knew it. 
He, he, he was not educated like Nicodemus. He was not rich like the rich young ruler. He was a blind beggar. And he couldn't do one single thing for Jesus. Andrew brought this out last week in a tremendous way. Andrew said, listen, we got way too many people that are serving Jesus by contract. In other words, Jesus, if you'll do this, I'll do that. God don't, homie, don't play that. God don't work that way. He doesn't, he doesn't work. Lord, you do this, I'll do that. God does not work by contract. He works by faith. And Barnabas knows he can't do one single blessed thing for Jesus, but he's calling on him just the same. And we have to, we have to understand that. And he is appealing. The only thing he has is to appeal to the mercy of God. Now listen to me, yes, 10,000 times, yes, God has mercy. Do I have anybody here to believe today that Jesus has mercy? Let me hear amen. amen, amen? He has mercy. Yes, he's omnipotent, he's omnipresent, he is full of grace, he is full of mercy. Thank God for that, I'm glad he has that. But that doesn't open up your blind eyes because you can say all day long, God has mercy, God has omnipotence, God has all power, go ahead. But Barnabas didn't stop there. He said, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. By the way, that's the one pronoun you really need to be caught up in this day and time. Have mercy on me. Yes, I know God loved the world, I know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I know that. But that's not what's going to open up your blind eyes. That's not what's going to mean anything to you. For God so loved you. And God so loved me that he gave his only begotten son. Lord, have mercy on me. That's what changed everything. That's what changed it all. Here's number four. A faith that opens your eyes is a faith that asks Jesus to meet your real need. Now, let me say that again. It is a faith that, that asks Jesus to meet your real need. Now, here, here's something kind of strange. So Barnabas is crying out, you know, Jesus, son of, son of David, have mercy on me. And, uh, and Jesus says, bring him here, call, call for him. Now, Barnabas jumps up and comes to Jesus. And this is a weird thing. Jesus looks at him and he says, what do you want? Duh. What? what do you mean what do I want, Captain Obvious? I mean, you know, I'm blind. What do you mean what do I want? Why did Jesus do that? Is, is Jesus dull? Is he, is he that, you know, off track? No. I'll tell you one reason I think why he did that. Do you remember back in verse 36 in this same chapter? Jesus asked his disciples the same question. He said, what do you want me to do for you? He heard, he heard you know, James and, and John talking. And uh, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And they gave him a dumb answer. I don't want to bog you down with any spiritual terms, but the Greek word is stupidus. All right, anyway, they get, he gave a stupid answer. <laughs> I don't even think that's a Greek word. But anyway, so they just, they said, listen, Jesus, we know that you're going, this is what they could have said. We know you're going to die. You've told us three times you're going to be buried, you're going to raise again. And Jesus said, okay, well, what do you want me to do for you? Well, Jesus, all we want you to do is let us know how we can bring glory to you. That's what we want to do. Well, they didn't do that. They did the opposite of that. Yeah. They said, we want to know how you can bring glory to us. So Jesus had already been burnt one time. So he asked Barnabas, what do you want me to do for you? Now, Barnabas could have said, well, I want you to bless me. Now, what, whatever. But Barnabas asked for his real need. Now, listen to me. I think... When it comes to our prayer life, our requests to Jesus are way too arbitrary. I think they're way too vague. I, I, I hear people say all the time, well, Lord, uh, meet my needs. That's, that's a good prayer, you know. But you know what Jesus is going to say? He's going to say, what need? What need are you talking about? What is it? Name it. Tell me about it. 
I know you got a lot of needs, but what needs specifically are you talking about? Here's a good one. I hear people say this all the time. Lord, forgive me of my sins. And the whole time Jesus was saying, what sins? Which ones? Or which one? Name it. Tell me. Because this is just too arbitrary. What sin is it? that you want me to forgive. I, uh, I've told this before, but years ago when I was, when I was just starting out in ministry, I had a privilege and opportunity to be in a pastor's conference with Miss Bertha Smith. Pastor Chris, you ever heard of Bertha Smith? Yeah. Anyway, Bertha Smith was the Lottie Moon of her day. She had given her life to China, just like Lottie Moon did. Uh, she was not married. She was married to Jesus. And she did pastor's conferences for pastors. Now, Bertha Smith was what you would call spooky spiritual. I mean, it's like she could read right through you. And, and, you know, she, she was just that, uh, you know, it was amazing. Uh, look it up, Google it, Bertha Smith. So I had an opportunity to be with Bertha Smith. So I was in a, I was in a, con- we were in a conference, you know, room, not being, there was probably about 20 pastors. And so Miss Bertha gets up and she says, okay, you guys are all pastors. I want you to get along, find, find a place to get by yourself in this room. And I want you to take a paper. I want, you to, I want you to take some paper. And I want you to get along. And I want you to write down. Ask the Holy Spirit of God to reveal to you what your sins are. And write them down. Write them down. That's a scary, uh, you know, thing. And so I had a legal pad. I had one of those yellow legal pads. I was already on my second page. <laughs> I mean, you know. But there was a pastor friend of mine. She goes over to him and he hasn't written down anything. Now, Miss Bertha Smith was about this tall, and she, she was just as full of grit as Daniel was. She looked at that pastor and said, hey, brother, you had not written anything down. What, why have why, why you written anything down yet? I mean, she's saying this out loud for everybody could hear it. And he said, well, Miss Bertha, I can't think of anything. And she said, guess, <laughs> and you'll get it right. Well, sometimes we're so arbitrary with Jesus. Jesus, forgive me my sin. And the whole time Jesus said, which one? What is it? Name it. Lord, meet my needs. Which one? Name it. Number five, faith that opens your eyes is a faith that acts in faith. Now, faith is action. It acts in faith. We don't have faith in faith, but it acts in faith toward Jesus. Look at verse 49. Verse 49, he said, get up. He's calling you. And he threw off his coat. And he jumped up and he came to Jesus. Now everybody look up here a minute. Think about that coat. Uh, Some translations call it a cloak. I I like that translation because I think that's what it was. But think about that cloak. That's everything to, to Bartimaeus. That's his life. Everything he owns is in that cloak. It's his house. It's his bed, it's his warmth in the winter, it's his shade from the summer, everything to him. That's it, everything he owned. And you notice it said he jumped up to get to Jesus. Now, understand this, when he jumped up to get to Jesus, he's not, he's not, he hadn't, he's not seeing yet. He's still blind, but he jumps up to get to Jesus. He can't see Jesus but how many are glad? It don't matter if you see Jesus. Jesus sees you. And all God's people say it. Amen. Jesus sees you. Doesn't matter if you see him or not. And that's all that mattered to Bartimaeus. Then number six. Told you it was going to be fast. A bunch of doubters. <laughs> a faith that opened your eyes is a faith that once you truly see Jesus, you're going to want to follow him. Look at verse 52. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has saved you. Immediately he could see and began to follow Jesus on the road. Jesus was so honored by his faith, he didn't even have to touch him. You remember in chapter eight, verse 22, he healed that unknown blind man. He spit on the ground and he put it on his eyes. But this Barnabas, he didn't even have to touch him. Now his life as a beggar is over. Now his life as a blind beggar is over. Now his life, all of that is in the past. 
Now he can see. And the first thing he sees is Jesus himself. And Jesus didn't even have to say, come and follow me. He couldn't run him off with a stick. Barnabas followed Jesus. Now, don't you listen to me. You listen to me say amen. For the next several months, I probably will be saying some things that maybe I shouldn't say because I'm on my way out. <laughs> and uh, I love what Pastor Andrew and Chris, Danny, our pastors, Jamie, all of them. I, I love what we're trying to do around here by making disciples. I get that. I love that. But I want to tell you something. None of us pastors should have to get up here and beg and borrow and steal and wine and dine to get you to follow Jesus. Somebody say amen. Amen. We shouldn't have to do it. We listen. There are some of you and and bless your sweetheart. Many of you are stepping up to the plate. You really are. I mean, you're serving. Uh, we, We had a team this past week that spent a week in the mountains of Norcott, and it wasn't a vacation. And they didn't go up there to see the leaves change. It was not, they, they, listen, if you run into anybody that was on that mission team this past week, the first thing you'll see, they are wore out. They are wore, slap, out. Why? Because they worked. They worked this week trying to help people with the hurricane, get out of the hurricane. So many of you are doing, many of you are stepping up the plate and you're giving. Uh, Many of you are doing that. Our our giving in this church has never been greater in the history of this church. Uh, And and look, 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 look at this shoe. By the way, I want to just say something about these shoe boxes. Over there is already at least 400 shoe boxes. So we've got some teenagers and some people in this church that are barely saved. So what I'd like for you to do is sometime go over there and steal those boxes over there and bring them right here. Can I get an amen? Amen. So that we can see a ton of boxes here too. Go over there, take some of those. I told you, I'm saying stuff I shouldn't say. (laughs) But, you know, we shouldn't have to whine and dine and beg and borrow and steal for you to get into the word so the word can get into you, so you can go to a Bible study, so you can serve others in need, so you can go pass out flyers, so you can give and tithe. We shouldn't have to do that because one moment looking at Jesus, you should automatically want to follow him. And all God's people said. How far did Barnabas fall in? We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. Did Jesus say, Barnabas, you don't have to go, you don't have to go past Jericho. I got this from now on. Just go, go back to your people. I don't find that in scripture. Now I've got an idea. And once again, it's my idea. So don't, don't bank on this. Okay. You know, you got pastor Chris that will really teach the word. I'm just kind of guessing. That's what I do. Do you remember on the day of Pentecost, how many people were in that upper room? 120. And we don't know who all they were. Could it be that Bartimaeus was in that crowd? Could it be that that's why we know his name? Jesus had healed hundreds of people and we don't know their name. He healed a woman of a blood disease, called her daughter. We don't know her name. He opened up deaf ears and blinded eyes and lame walk. We don't know their name. But for this healing, we know his name. And not only do we know his name, we know his father's name. Could it be that he was a leader in the early church? Could it be this was his testimony? that the early church knew about him. You see, well over a thousand years before John Newton wrote, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. Bartimaeus beat him to it. And he said, yeah, I get it. John Newton, you got nothing on me, brother. 
I once was lost, now I'm found. I once was literally blind, but now I see. How do you get to that point? First of all, that you know that you know that you're saved and your sin is forgiven and you have heaven as your home. And secondly, how do you get to the point where you're willing and can't wait to follow Jesus no matter the cost? How do you get to that? Well, Jesus tells us, your faith has saved you. Let's pray together. Father, every head bowed, every head goes, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Father. We don't have faith in faith. We have faith in you. You are the object of our faith. But if we would put our faith in you, if we'd recognize that we have a real need, you're our only hope. If we would truly see that yes, we once were lost and now we're found, we once were blind, but now we see, then we would just follow you. We wouldn't have to be coaxed, wouldn't have to be made feel guilty, have a guilt trip put on us. No need for that. Just follow you. And no matter where we are in our walk with you. Paul said, we walk by faith and not by sight. And it'll always be that way until we see you face to face. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You've been trying to figure this thing out. Are you here today? And you would say, you know, pastor, I, uh, I want to know that my sins are forgiven. I want to know that heaven is my home. I want to have my spiritual eyes opened. I'm working on it. That's why I'm in church. And God bless you for that. I mean that with all my heart. But church is not the answer. Jesus said, it's your faith that will save you. And we make no apologies for that around here. I know the world is demanding a sign. The world would love for this roof to get up and turn around and come back down. But Jesus would say, no, that's, that's just by, that's by sight. Somebody would explain it away. Somebody would say, that's just an AI video, can't trust it. That's why it's imperative. Just like a little child, we trust you by faith. You ever done that? Have you ever just let go and say, Jesus, I'm, I'm trying to figure this thing out. I'm, I'm trying to learn the Bible. I'm trying to do what's right. I'm, I'm trying to turn over a new leaf, trying to do what's best. And thank God for that. But it's not enough. Because without faith, you'll never see the kingdom of God. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, and by the way, let's all just stand right now. Everybody just go ahead and stand. And uh, heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed. But I'd like for you to say, and we're, praise team's going to sing us out of here. We're going to be here a couple more minutes. But heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Jeff, there was a moment in my life when I said, God, have mercy on me. Not my wife, not my husband, not my parents, not my children. Lord, have mercy on me. And when I cried out to him and asked him to have mercy, immediately he saved me. Immediately he came into my life. Immediately he opened my spiritually blind eyes. And now I see. I haven't seen him face to face, but that doesn't matter because I know he sees me. And I'm just as sure of heaven as I'm standing in this worship center today. And I just want to give Jesus praise and glory. I don't want glory for myself like those disciples did for a while. I want to give him glory. I want to give him praise. Because I know that when I die, when that time comes, to be absent from my body is going to be present with the Lord. And I want to worship him for that. If you know that, all over the building, raise your hand. Raise both hands. 
Just praise the Lord just for a moment, all over the building. Amen. I wish y'all could see what we're seeing right now, how awesome that is. Thank you. You can put your hands down. But there may be somebody here today, you couldn't raise your hand just then. And you're, you're wanting to be honest, and thank God for that. But to be honest, you, you don't want to lie. You don't want to stretch the truth. You want to know that you know, and you couldn't raise your hand just then, but you would like to. You say, Pastor, how do I do that? Your faith will save you. Your faith that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That nobody comes unto the Father except through him. And with a simple childlike prayer in your heart, pray, Jesus, have mercy on me. I want to see. I want to know you. I want your forgiveness. If that's you today, right where you are, pray a simple prayer like that. Make it your prayer. Jesus, have mercy on me. Forgive me my sin. Come into my life. Open my spiritually blinded eyes that I might see you and know that you're the way, the truth, and the life and that I'm forgiven and you promise a home in heaven. But until I get there, may I follow you. May you be the Lord of my life. Anybody here today pray a simple prayer like that in your heart? Would you raise your hand now? Raise it up, hold it up, keep it up. I prayed that prayer or a prayer like that right now in my heart. All right. Are you a disciple? Are you a follower of Jesus? Have you been keeping Jesus at arm's length? Are you fully devoted to him? If not, why not? All I can tell you is take another look at what he did for you, how he forgave you. And at one time he opened your spiritual eyes. Come back to him. See him for the first time than you've seen him in a long time. And don't be afraid. Follow him. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word today. In your name we pray.